from the Joy News Centre. This is News at 8. Right, you're welcome to the Primetime Bulletin on Joy News on Multi TV. Coming up, ceremony to kickstart Teshi Home War festivities postponed for security reasons. President Mahama promises massive road projects over the remainder of his four year term as he inspects 17 kilometer Anya to Awashi Road. In a related development, five countries in West Africa are mulling a high speed rail link to connect the sub region and facilitate economic growth and integration. Group petitions president to consider allowing election of DCEs. And unattractive salaries cited as one of the factors contributing to low number of university trained agriculture mampa. We also have business, sports, showbiz and international news all coming up in the next 60 minutes. News at 8 with Israel Lai. President Mahama says government will in the next four years embark on a major overhaul of the country's road infrastructure to minimize agitations linked to poor roads. He announced this when he led a team of government officials to inspect work on the 17-kilometer road that will connect the Insawam Road at Pokwase to the George Wakabush Motorway at Awoshi. The project is expected to be completed by December this year. Work on the project which started in January last year is in two phases. A three-kilometer stretch from Awoshi where the inspection started to Anya, funded by Agence Française de Développement. The African Development Bank is also funding the 12-kilometer Anya to Pokwasi stretch. The china Jianji Corporation contractors working on the project estimate the cost at a little over 30 million Ghana cities. To improve safety along the road, provision has been made for eight-foot bridges at critical intersections. Traffic lights along the corridor will also be solar powered. The president continued to Anya, where he met with the chiefs and people and assured them compensation will be paid to all whose structures have been demolished to make way for the construction. Anya market, drawing, about a new market. Then many. Many be no fair about how many no. Ni a bag belly bear from uh, Awoshi all the way to Pokwasi. He was uh, communities near your neck bear no fair. Life is not going to be the same again. You are going to be a major transit point from the eastern part, from the western part of the city to the northern part. He was traffic fair near your uh, so man, uh, Kaneshi, Malam. Uh, Cape Coast, Namentoni, Aya, towards and Sawangbe, Abachobie. The president's next stop was Olebu, where he was taken round to see the progress of work. He then went to Ayawaso, where he said there will be major improvements once the project is over. In 14 schools along this road to be rebuilt with modern schools, I mean, that will make a major impact on the communities, providing them with water, you know, a new market with uh, hospital, you know, accident uh, center, you know, and all the interventions that are taking place. I think this is one of the most, you know, significant road projects that we have done in this country. President Mahama says opening up the road network to improve transportation in the country will help fast track development in the region. Roads have become an issue of social tension in our country today. Remember what happened in Ashaman and several other places. And so one of the major interventions government is going to do is to improve the transport sector. Because every country that has developed, you know, you have to open up the country so that goods and services and human beings can move, you know, uh, freely across the country. And so over the next four years, government is going to make a major intervention in the transport sector, in the railways, in the roads. We're going to open up the roads significantly so that um, it would add to the economic growth that we're seeing. We are residents of Himang Lower Dentra in Chufu Atimokwa constituencies in the central region are worried about the poor nature of the roads in their constituencies. They claim the poor nature of the roads is affecting the quality of their lives and the earlier help comes to them, the better. 
A visit to a number of communities, including Jukwa to Praso and Praso to Etimokwa, by Joy News confirmed the deplorable nature of the roads. According to the Member of Parliament for Chifo Etimokwa, Samoa Tuomua, this has been an albatross around his neck. From Praso to the adjoining districts, including Asinfusu, Dunkwa Onofeng, and Cape Coast, the roads are in such deplorable state that a short journey from Fusu to Dunkwa, for example, takes more than four hours. The MP was particularly worried about pregnant women who stay afar in the hinterlands. As he says, it takes them about a day to get to the district hospital when they are in labor. The MP is looking forward to the Ministry of Roads and Highway honoring the assurances of reconstructing some of the roads in the constituencies. If they even promise coming to do a road inspection within my constituency, and I'm still looking forward that that thing can, 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 can come into reality. Even apart from that, like you saw on the road network. Kofi is a taxi driver at Jukwa and tells Joy News the kind of hardship the people in the area, especially farmers, have been going through just to cut their produce to the market centers and the suffering of school children on the road. <laughs> Correspondent Georgina Apia filed this report. Well, I'm sure there's, they've also heard from the president saying that over the next four years, things are going to be changing rapidly. Meanwhile, railway development experts from five West African countries are calling for the implementation of a high-speed rail line through the sub-region to address transportation challenges. The experts from Ghana, Togo, Nigeria, Ivory Coast and Benin believe such a corridor will greatly help in the transportation of goods and services and are hoping to have the infrastructure in place by 2020. The project seeks to transform the sub-region's transportation system with new high-speed passenger and goods rail services. It is also to facilitate industrialization of the countries, improve transportation of agricultural produce, and create immediate political awareness for further economic emancipation of the people. The country representative of Hancock Engineering International Incorporation, Canada, Dr. Enoch Jegbla is quite optimistic about the project. I dare say to this meeting that major commercial activities originate and flow through this corridor. And this is the place to be at this time. Anko BTB proposes that the project will be funded through the PPP initiative so that the project can have what I call immediate feasibility within the subregion. A representative from Nigeria, Chief Obaga Idu, called on heads of West African states to remain committed to the implementation of the project in order to ease my rate of transportation difficulties, hindering economic development. You agree with me that if you are going to do a red line, you are going to inconvenience some people. It means they must accept the project and be willing to sacrifice. We cannot sit down here and simply write that by way of order. We need politically connected, politically powerful people in the various countries that are involved who will be able to ensure that the people accept this project and cooperate with us. He also asked the delegates to get actively involved to ensure the project was executed within the scheduled timeline of 2020. The chief imam, Sheikh Osmanu Nuhu Shaributu, has called on Muslim youth across the country to exhibit the positive traits of the Holy Prophet Muhammad during and after the month of Ramadan. He said fasting without praying and practicing good morals is simply starving. He was speaking at the third annual Ramadan lectures in Accra. The annual Ramadan lecture third in series is aimed at encouraging Muslim youth during the fasting period while reminding them of their role in society. 
Dr. Sheikh Osman Nuhu Sharbutu used the opportunity to advise the youth on the need of moral aptitude during and after the fast. Allah says we have to fast. If you fast, you get away from you know, doing bad things, sin. Because Prophet Muhammad says, Oh, you youth. When there is some ego in the ego, he who is capable must get a wife. When there is some ego, if you don't have the power, the fale, 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 then you have to fast. Because fasting has done some evil in treatment that will keep you away from having a dubious mind to do dubious and filthy things. Because it will break down your sexual desire. Executive Director of African Center for Energy Policy, Mohamed Amin Anta, called on Muslim youth to demand accountability for Ghana's oil production. According to him, the youth has been the least beneficiary so far. Our wealth is not just a trust given to us by God. Our constitution also says that it is a trust. The constitution says that the oil resources shall be held in trust by the president on behalf of the people. So it is also a trust. And so we have a duty to ensure that it is managed well. The monitoring role is what some of us are doing. But all of you in your communities must monitor. And therefore, you must ask questions as Muslims. We are too quiet, as if we don't belong to Ghana. If things are going well, we have to loud it. This is the only way Muslims can demonstrate our neutrality and our overriding interest as far as the management of Ghana's resources are concerned. Now, the Ministry of Interior has declared Thursday, August 8, 2013, as a statutory public holiday. A statement signed by Kwesi Ahoy, Minister for the Interior, said the holiday is in respect of the celebration of this year's Ido Fitter. The actual day the holiday was expected to fall on became an issue when the justice hearing the election petition sought to fix a day to hear oral addresses of the parties. They eventually settled on August 7 with a provi proviso that it could change should the day be a holiday. As it stands now, it means that oral addresses will be heard on Wednesday as fixed by the Supreme Court justices. Now, right now in the studio, I've been joined by my colleague, Anil Sabute, who has been following the election petition uh, here in all this while. And uh, he joins me with some volumes uh, of, uh, there, of, of documents <laughs> of, the, of the final addresses, of the final rating addresses put together. Uh, by the petitioners and the respondents. And we're going to go uh, over some of, of the issues that have come up, and uh, especially as we await or wait till the August 7, that's Wednesday, when we're going to hear these oral, the summary of these oral, uh, oral addresses. Thank you very much uh, for joining me, Annie. Uh, tonight, we're, we're looking at one issue, which has to do with overvoting, overvoting which right. is one of the issues the petitioners are seeking or are basing their claims that uh, they want the courts to overturn uh, some, some of the results. But so what exactly is the point they're coming from, as, as contained in the addresses? Okay, so, so I'm reading verbatim, okay, and this is from the petitioners, and the petitioners are talking about uh, uh, Nana Kufado, uh, Dr. Muhammad Baumia, and that of Jacob Echebelante, who's been represented by Philip Addison and their counsel as well. And this is what it says, the case on the overvoting is in inextricably tied to the guarantee of the principle of equal and universal adult suffrage of the Ghanaian citizen by the Constitution. It is respectfully submitted that, under the Constitution, each registered voter who casts his or her vote in the manner prescribed by the law can only have his or her vote counted once. The protection of this principle by the body constitutionally mandated to do so, that's the second respondent, that's the Electoral Commission, can be ascertained by an examination of how ballots issued to voters were counted for. In this case, as right, we're talking about two scenarios. First, is that it is eminently clear that where all the number of people duly registered to vote at a particular polling station turn up on election day to vote, and in bracket they, they write, and this can be discovered from the number of ballots issued, the number of ballots found in the box at the end of the polls cannot be more than the number of voters registered to vote at the polling station. Recall that uh, when the uh, 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 during the process examinations, one of the issues that came up has to do with what really constitute the right definition of overvoting. overvoting yeah. And there were various one of them to the extent that you know, uh, at one point in time, somebody had to talk about 
foreign materials. And this is the, exactly the point that the petitioners as, have so submitted to the court. So this is how they've wrapped it up precisely so in so, their case. Exactly. So on Wednesday, they're going to, when they are given the 30 minutes to make oral arguments about it, they will be seeking to expand on that to be, in order to sort of appeal to the judges that to show, on to show why they think that overvoting took place. And that the vote How are not. the respondents uh, responding to this one in their rating addresses? So if you look at the first, second, third respondents, I mean, it appears that they, they, they appear to be singing from the same hymn sheet. But let's look at it, uh, the argument for, put forward by the second respondent, that's the Electoral Commission. Which is commission. the Electoral Commission, Absolutely. which yeah. actually conducted the, uh, the elections. The elections. And this is what the question I don't will be seeking to tell the court. He said, Dr. Farijan, in his evidence in chief, Tender the registers of the, th the three polling stations as exhibit EC8, EC9, and EC10, which debunked the allegation that the vote in the ballot box exceeded the number of persons entitled to vote in the respective polling stations. The exhibit Dr. Afarijan had for the three polling stations also showed that exhibits shown to Mr. Sidon Kita were different from those served on the second respondent. That's the EC. It is submitted that there is ample evidence for your lordship to conclude that. The petitioners have not established that there was overvoting as they were not able to cite a single example among the 26,002 polling stations in which the vote in the ballot box exceeded the number of persons entitled to vote at the polling stations. Is right. So this is because the understanding of voting is different from what uh, the petitioners are claiming. Precisely. For now, that is the argument that all of them have made. So it will be interesting to, to find out on Wednesday what you know the argument will be. But... Like we always say, I don't know, the, the judges will have the right of say. They will determine eventually Absolutely. whether indeed uh, what overvoting constitutes or what constitutes overvoting. Okay, exactly. And just, just, just before I, I take leave of you, Israel, I'm, I'm also learning that, you know, the in, in the petitioner's case, they cited several authorities from Northern Ireland, um, Kenya, Canada, and, 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 that to bat and Nigeria to address their point. And today um, I'm learning that... Uh, They've submitted documents, a, a document to the Supreme Court that seeks to sort of expand the argument further. So, for example, if we took a case in Kenya, with the, the, the electoral process in Kenya with respect to election disputes, you know, they give more arguments, more flesh to, to, to the... Okay, to but the I thought they, there was a deadline for them to do that. Absolutely, but I, I, I'm not too sure what um, the argument is, but if, if, if indeed it has been taken over by the court, then... Essentially, they have no problem with okay. But it's going to be interesting on Wednesday, and everybody's looking forward to it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was Ani Osabute. He's been covering the election petition hearing, and he joined us in the studio to give us uh, some education or enlightenment on uh, some of the contents of the written addresses of both the petitioners and the respondents. We're taking a break. We'll be back with more news. Don't go away. The people of Teshi will have to wait another week to start their home war celebrations after the main ceremony to kickstart the festivities was postponed. The first Monday in August is the day when the customary rites to usher in the ban on drumming and noise making is performed. Emmanuel Ante, who was at Teshi, however, reports the customary rites could not be performed today. The people waited anxiously for the performance of the ritual for the ban on noise making, which never happened. They started gathering at the town square from midday with the expectation they were going to start the Homo celebrations by 6 p.m. on Monday. Instead, they were met with a heavy security presence, some in police uniforms and others in plain clothes at the town square. These men were ready to perform the rituals, but the presence of the security prevented them from going through with the ceremony. This forced them to hold a meeting behind closed doors. The police, sensing danger, beefed up security in town to avert any violence. According to the police, an agreement was reached between the regional security and the traditional leaders of Teshi that the ceremony should be held next Monday. At the time of leaving the grounds, the police were still stationed in the town square where the ceremony will be held. Emmanuel Lante, Joy News, Accra. Former University of Ghana Vice Chancellor Professor Kwejua Sensuatri has attributed the low number of university trained manpower in the agricultural sector to the unattractive salaries offered and the generally unappealing nature of the jobs there. He was speaking at the commemoration of the 65th anniversary of the College of Agriculture at the University of Ghana. 
Even though the agricultural sector has great potential, it is saddled with several challenges, especially in developing countries where there is low penetration of new technology and several environmental challenges, among others, resulting in greater risks and high costs. Competition between agriculture and other sectors, environmental resources like water and pastures is also another constraint. The challenges notwithstanding, however, they are great prospects for professionals who opt to go into the sector. But the former vice-chancellor says its ability to attract quality professionals, especially university graduates, is fast diminishing. In some countries, agricultural studies are viewed as a last resort for many students who have not been accepted into professional programs such as medicine, pharmacy and engineering. One way of raising the appeal of agriculture programs to the youth is to make it more profitable and less adios. Many potential scientists and lecturers are disinclined to pursue graduate level studies because the jobs that are available afterward at research organizations and universities offer non-competitive salaries. There is a clear indication that the number of postgraduates in agriculture in developing countries today, including Ghana, is too low to ensure the sustainable development of the agricultural sector. Daniel Ninsen, an MPhil master student in a great business, shares some of the frustrations of his colleagues. The incentives are not there. You see, so most, you know, finish school and then they want to find the easiest way. And in Ghana, I mean, what are some of the easiest ways? To finish school, you know, drop some proposal or CV, take you to the banks, to the wherever, and then you find a job. If we really, really want to improve agriculture, then we need to give the needed importance to every area on the value chain. I can work in a financial institution. If there are enough agricultural financial institutions, then straightforward, after school, that institution absorbs me. If there are financial insurance companies, I mean, that are, you know, towards agriculture, then from there, it can absorb me. Dr. Thimbiano Lamodia, a representative from the Food and Agriculture Organization, said the challenges confronting the sector cannot be ignored. The theme for the 65th anniversary celebrations is promoting sustainable agricultural practices to promote food security. <laughs> A group calling itself Coalition for the Election of DCs has petitioned President John Mahama to consider the election of district chief executives. The group, mainly officials and members of the Progressive People's Party, says the current agitations of the appointment of DCs makes it all too obvious that it is high time Ghanaians are giving the chance to decide their local governors. National Chairman of the PPP, Ni Alote Bruhamund, who led the coalition to the Flagstaff House, told President Mahama the current practice where chief executives are appointed by the president undermines the constitution. Many do not worry about legacy while in office, but we believe your excellency has a rare and present opportunity to give the people of Ghana an opportunity to directly and popularly elect their MMDCs without any interference from government as an enduring and timeless legacy during your tenure as President of the Republic of Ghana. This petition is therefore submitted for your careful consideration to allow Ghanaians to exercise their right to freely contest and compete for election as metropolitan, municipal and district chief executives under the principle of universal adult suffrage. President Jumahama, meanwhile, says though he supports the proposal, he believes it must be done gradually. I believe that the issue you are addressing, that is the election of district chief executives, falls within the more complex gamut of the total idea of decentralization and devolution of power to the local level. I have always been a believer in devolving power to the local level because I think that our people will better handle their own destinies if we place it in their own hands than if we direct it from the center. The point even is with a growing population, it makes it very difficult to conduct a centralized governance system in a country like ours. And so what we have been working on is 
going the full hog in terms of decentralization. There have been some legislative obstacles that uh, an interministerial committee, which I chaired as vice president and continue to chair as president, has been working on to try and ensure that we don't only uh, conduct decentralization by uh, word but also by deed and that actually true power is devolved to district assemblies. Two people have been sentenced to 30 years in prison by the Accra Circuit Court for conspiracy and armed robbery. Accused persons Kofi Poku and Prosper AJ were arrested through a collaborative effort between some residents of Adabraka and the Accra Central Police Command. They were arrested by some resident after snatching the handbag of a nurse who was on her way to work using a motorbike. The arrest was made when they were given a hot chase by a good Samaritan who followed them in his car and hit them off the main road and raised an alarm for support from residents. On the offense of conspiracy, they were sentenced 15 years, 15 years. And on the offense of uh, uh, robbery, they were sentenced 30 years each. So, but the, the sentence is to run concurrently. So that means they will serve the higher sentence in it. They will be on their way to Insawan prison to start their sentence. Sergeant Danso urged Ghanaians to help in the fight of ensuring law and order in the country by bringing to book miscreants within communities whilst observing personal safety. Transport operators have decried their inadequate police presence on highways, especially at night. They are worried highway robberies would go up if the Ghana Police Service does not intensify patrols whilst ensuring that long distance buses have escorts. The safety of drivers and passengers who travel long distances, especially at night and dawn, has become doubtful following recent reported incidents. A directive by the Ghana Police Service to have escorts on such long-distance journeys about two years ago seemed to have been ignored, even though some transport operators have tried to maintain police escorts. Oye Travel and Tours, for instance, though has police officers on its Wyambo Gatanga route, is unable to deploy them on all its passes. And those ones traveling in the night without a policeman, I would say those policemen in the war buses, um, we move together in a form of, let's say, convoy. So let's say if, assuming 10 buses is moving in the convoy, and we're having five policemen, in, one in each of the buses, I think the other five are also secured. Though the other operators appreciate the concept, they believe the police service does not have the numbers. If you want to employ all of them into our various buses on a highway, uh, you just imagine what will happen at the police stations. Or do we have the men to, to do all this? I think if we are doing it, not only on Accra Kumasi route or everywhere, so that because whilst there's in a much security on our route, they will intend attacking different routes where there's no security. If the, the, the armed robber or the highway robber hear the suggest the siren of the of the of the highway patrol, it will just spare them off. The passengers are equally worried. The police patrol should be very effective because you know you have only one policeman inside. That man alone cannot do anything when the car is attacked. So I always believe that after every barrier. If you have some policemen following the bus to the next barrier, they want to reach the next barrier then in Hanover. I think that would be better. You have to have more policemen on the road because the armed robbers, they have different tactics. They can even change. They can attack after the barrier. So the police service, meanwhile, admits it is challenged with personnel and logistics to enforce the directive, but as the transport operators are partly to blame. It is a shared responsibility. If the police want to do it, then they won't want to do it. As I told you, we don't have the numbers. So in some instances where even the people have agreed for police protection and the vehicles are more that we cannot provide each and every uh, vehicle a police officer, we have gone an extra mile to ensure that we give them escorts. So we, are, we have just our patrols because when it's always getting to festivities, periods like uh, the sala uh, and other things and now that uh, the tension, everybody's waiting for the uh, court verdict, it goes on us to you know, intensify our patrols, which we are doing, and we are doing it scientifically. We, we in the meantime, it wouldn't hurt to continue to bid your friends and loved ones safe journey each time they embark on one of these long journeys. Abigail Adamakwenchi, reporting for Joy News.
Right after the break, we're bringing you business news with Parkway CSR. Welcome to the business segment with me, Park Asari. In our first story, government through the Central Bank is set to review existing banking acts and develop a regulatory framework to allow the establishment of a deposit protection scheme. The deposit protection scheme, according to Deputy Finance Minister Kweku Rikit Hagan, will protect depositors in the event of a bank failure. The Deputy Finance Minister was speaking at the third Ghana Investment Awards in Accra. The 2013 Ghana Investment Awards assessed the performance of 22 brokerage and investment advisor firms licensed by the Securities and Exchange Commission. In all, 13 awards were presented. Two new awards, Advertising Campaign of the Year and Deal of the Year, were introduced as part of this year's awards. Data Bank Brokerage Limited emerged the Broker Dealer of the Year while SICFSL Research won the Gold Award for the Research Report of the Year. The best growing new investment firm went to IFS Capital, while First Bank Financial Services won the Gold Prize for the Advertising Campaign of the Year. The Ecobank TTB merger also won the Deal of the Year. Sufa Kafuite of HFC Investments Limited picked the gold award for the most promising investment professional of the year. Deputy Minister of Finance and Economic Planning, Kweku Ricketts Hagan, said government is putting measures in place to make investment knowledge accessible to all. Government is tackling the menace of low financial education frontally through in increased introduction of financial education in our school's curriculum. In this way, Financial literacy will improve exponentially to enable us to, to take a full advantage of invest, investment to grow the economy. Government, through the assistance of German Development Corporation, has since 2010 added financial education to the content of three subjects. These are social studies, business management, and management in living. At the senior high schools. President of the Premier Network and Investment Club organizers of the awards, Kelvin Abdallah, said the awards is to inculcate the spirit of competition in the various brokerage firms in the country and to ensure members exhibit high level of professionalism in all their duties. Before the main awards, we have what we call a technical committee meeting where specialists from the industry would come together and set the criteria for that specific year's awards. So we look at returns that the various funds have have offered. We look at the activity that, for example, a given stock has achieved. But more importantly, we look at the cumulative data. So if we're talking of, let's say, the return for a particular scheme, how much return they have given to the investors who have put their money in. And then we look at other things like general structure and the investment strategy of that particular uh, scheme to determine what awards it would win. The ninth also saw Samuel Odruminta, a spare parts dealer who rose through the ranks to be an investor, being adjudged the winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award. Talo Oil has settled on Modak to build a new floating vessel, FPSO for the Trinibua and Yera Intumitan project, which is the country's second major oil field, apart from the Jubilee. The company, which has specialized in building floating and production vessels around the world, would also be responsible for maintaining and operating the vessel. According to the firm, the vessel they intend to build would have a production capacity of 80,000 barrels of crude a day, with a storage capacity of 1.7 billion barrels to be delivered by 2016. Now, Modek built the country's first FPSO for the Jubilee field at a cost of $750 million. Deputy Energy Minister, Deputy Energy and Petroleum Minister John Ginapo says government had a mind change about subsidizing kerosene by 50 million cities this year because current crude prices do not support it. He says government has rather decided to use the fans to subsidize solar lamps, which directly benefit consumers. He was addressing the media at a three-day oil and gas workshop. 
Kerosene and Premix Fuel recorded the highest increases in fuel price adjustments at the bi-monthly review last week. Premix Fuel, which sold at about 66 pesos per litre, went up to about 80 pesos. While Kerosene, which was selling at about 1 Ghana CDs 15 pesos per litre, is also now selling at 1 Ghana CDs 25 pesos, representing an 8.41% increase. But at a media training on the energy industry, Deputy Minister for the Sector John Jinapo indicated that government had no intentions of burdening consumers with the current price hikes. He explained subsidies on kerosene especially were being exploited. In 2013 alone, we had estimated that we would subsidize kerosene by 50 million Ghana cities. Unfortunately, the good and intended purpose is not serving uh, the rationale behind this noble idea. Research has indicated that only 20% of the subsidized kerosene gets to the final consumer. In addition to that, whilst we subsidize a gallon of kerosene at 4 Ghana City, it has been sold at 16 Ghana City in the rural areas. 80% of the kerosene we subsidize finds its way back into fuel tanks or vehicles through adulteration. The ministry has thought through this and we are convinced that it would be better to push the subsidy into solar lamps, which directly benefits the consumer. So far, we have supplied 20,000. Uh, we believe that if we're able to push this subsidy into solar lamps, we can supply as much as 500,000 solar lamps. He also mentioned the ministry was putting measures in place to light up ceremonial streets in the capital to attract investors. So if Ghana wants to be an investment destination, if we believe that Ghana is the gateway to West Africa, and Accra is the only international capital city. It's only proper, it's only appropriate that we improve the lightning system of the capital city. Not just for the sake of investment, but also for the sake of security, because uh, lighting provides a certain amount of security. The Honorable Boa has considered a team. We've already had our initial meetings We've mapped out a strategy, and I just want to inform you that very soon we shall roll out on a very, very massive scale uh, the refitting of most of the uh, street lighting systems in Accra. The Ministry of Energy and Petroleum, after successfully training journalists on the oil, gas and power sectors, launched the official press call. The price of medicine could soon be going up. This is mainly because of the environmental excise tax imposed on plastic materials used for packaging these drugs. Now, the tax implemented last year was 15% on both imported plastics and locally produced plastic packaging materials. It has, however, been reviewed downwards to 10% and also now includes plastic packaging materials for pharmaceutical products which were earlier exempted. Now, this forms part of tax reviews by government in a bid to raise additional revenue. About 24% of shares on the Ghana Stock Exchange are still being held manually by investors almost four years after automation. This was contained in the Stock Exchange's Securities Depository Half-Year Report. Now, following the automation of the stock market activities, shares certificates are expected to be converted into electronic form to aid trading. But it appears some investors are st still want to hold on to their paper certificates. Now, the report also revealed that 7.3 billion shares are being traded electronically. The new gold exchange fund came up as one of the listed equities having all its shares traded electronically or listed in the depository finance house. Data Bank managed the highest volumes of trades as well as value of shares traded on the Ghana Stock Exchange. And that's it for the business segment. My name is Park Asari. Right, so you're welcome to Showbiz. And I should have done this earlier. Our, our social media issue has to do with our Doom Praise. It was a massive success despite the challenges. So were you there and how did it go for you? We have a few minutes to take some. Some of your comments are coming already, but I should have announced this earlier. I do apologize. But patrons who had tickets but were unable to witness last Saturday's massive Adum Praise uh, Gospel Concert headlined by Kirk Franklin have expressed outrage with the organizers. It is still not clear what exactly must have gone wrong, but the organizers have apologized profusely for the inconvenience and embarrassment. 
That notwithstanding, the show was mega, and one that could easily pass for the great-grandmother of all shows. It was certainly a night when Kek Franklin and the rest of the artists on the bill at the Perez Dome got radical with the gospel music message. The thousands who made it into the 14,000 capacity venue certainly got their money's worth, if not more. And they certainly had a lot of praises to shower for the performance. I love it. I love it. Like, I had to come all the way from England to see Africa. The power and the presence of God. The, all the artists, Kirk Franklin, I mean, when he stepped on stage, the, uh, it, it was something else. There was a holy hour. Every year for me, it's a bit slow. Maybe up to the year of five. Wow. Maybe it's a bit slow. Little wonder, the estimated thousands who missed out because of the ticketing challenges were outraged. Well, the organizers have however apologized and promised to make up for it, even as investigations continue into what must have gone wrong. Right, so certainly it was a great performance. And I'm um, trying to retweet some of the comments that you have posted so far. Um, now, Northern Governor says, I only demand, uh, okay, that's uh, not what we're look asking for. And then Baba says, well, it might have been very successful perhaps to only those who were fortunate to have gotten comfortable, a comfortable place to sit. Some, same cannot be said about those who are not able to get in, even though they equally bought tickets for the program. For me, such people should have their monies refunded back to them aside the apology rendered as natural justice will require. And uh, Baba, that's an issue that the organizers are looking into. Seydou and I says, I enjoyed myself to the fullest. Eric Joseph Addo says, in fact, it was, I was thrilled beyond measure. Komla says, uh, well, he was referring to an earlier comment. Fifi says, although I was not there, but I can say it was a banger. Kudos to Airtel and the multimedia group. And Sylvia says, it was a great experience, if not the greatest. But personally, I, I think next time tickets should be issued according to the capacity of the venue. So lots of your comments suggesting, uh, giving us some great feedback. And certainly we'll be looking at all of that. Uh, and uh, as you are aware, investigations are ongoing into what exactly must have gone wrong and we promise to bring you the full story when it becomes available. That's it for the bulletin. Before I go though, a quick run through our top stories. The ceremony to kickstart the Teshi Homo Festivities has been postponed for security reasons. President Mahama has promised massive road projects over the remainder of his four-year term as he inspected a 17-kilometer Anya to Awashiro. In a related development, five countries in West Africa are mulling a high-speed rail link to connect the sub-region and facilitate economic growth and integration. A group has petitioned the president to consider allowing election of MMDCs. And unattractive salaries have been cited as one of the factors contributing to low number of university-trained agricultural manpower. That's it for the bulletin. For more news, log on to myjournaline.com. Have a good evening.